Hey, everybody. Did you like how I just did my own theme song just there? I hope you did. Jay here with a quick interruption. Um, I don't have ads, so I'm going to advertise myself in the middle of this podcast. Why not? Um, this is uh, somewhere north of 300 episodes when you're listening to this. And golly gee, it has been a journey. And I appreciate you coming with me on that journey for this whole time that you've been here. Maybe you've been here from the beginning. Maybe you've been here since like an episode ago. I'm just glad you're here. But I do have to say this. We here at Blockbusting, and there's literally a we. Chorkin, come around. Come around to the other side of the camera so we can see. Look, guys, I got a staff now, all right? I got interns, okay? I got producers. I got stuff to, to handle here at the space that I record at um, and elsewhere. And I want to be able to pay these people. And I, unfortunately, uh, do not make the kind of money to pay these people myself. Um, and that's where I hope that you can come in. Um, by supporting the Blockbusting Patreon. Yes, that's right. We've got a Patreon. I haven't plugged it in a bit, but I'm going to start plugging it heavy now because why not? I want to pay these folks, all right? And you can support the podcast for just as low as a dollar a month, all right? Dollar a month goes back into the show. I'm not even paying myself. I don't care about paying myself for this podcast. I care about giving a little something back to the people who help me out because I'm getting a lot of help from people these days. And, uh, and they deserve a little something for their efforts beyond just my eternal thanks and gratitude, which they're going to get anyway. Um, so you can subscribe for a dollar a month. You start getting access to bonus content from me, like I'm posting uh, episodes of my game show Wrong that I'm doing here in Los Angeles that I'm not posting to the public. Um, I'll get, start posting bonus episodes of, of me talking about stuff again. Uh, what's good with Jay Light, where I just talk about what I liked that I saw on the television and the internet and stuff these days, because that's how you do for Patreon. Um, we still have the, uh, the Jay Flicks level, the $5 tier, where you can get access to my full film, television, comedy special library. That's just $5 a month. It's cheaper than pretty much every streaming service out there, except for, I guess, Apple TV is 5 bucks a month. Um, and they have Severance and Ted Lasso, so you really can't go wrong there. And they got Coda. I mean, Coda, what a delight. Um, but you know what I've got? Xanadu. <laughs> and nobody else has that. Pfft, duh. I've got A Day Without a Mexican, Los Stitches' least favorite movie. You listen to that episode? It's a great episode. But you've got to watch the movie, which I have, on JFlix for $5 a month. i got a bunch of weird stuff. So go uh, consider, please, subscribing to the Patreon for Blockbusting. The link is in the show notes. Or you can just go type into your little web browser right now, tippity tap it into patreon.com slash blockbusting. Again, that is patreon.com slash blockbusting. And your support will go to helping me throw a little cash the way of the fine folks who help make this podcast happen. Um, that, that, that's all I'm asking is you throw me a little something so I can throw them a little something, okay? It's going, we're going direct. Because, you know, it, this is like thoughts and prayers with guns. Like, saying thanks is only going to do so much. I want to give them cash, okay? At least buy them a coffee or something. So, Patreon.com slash blockbusting. You can join and support for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, and, and, and that's all there is, folks. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Oh, let me tell you something. makes me feel good. Let's rock and roll. Let's do it. I don't look great, but that's the one thing I will say about podcasting. I'm like, oh, when did we require video for like the one thing we don't have to wear makeup I for, know. you know? <laughs> I I was running out of the house. I'd finished working out and I was like, I'm sweating my I'm sweating my ass off. I'm gonna look so bad when I show up today. It's well, we be, can look equally bad. Also, like you look better than I do, that's for sure. We both don't look like influencers, which is perfect for <laughs> yeah. this movie, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. What a, what a way to transition. Yeah, Hi. what a smooth transition. Welcome to Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate movies. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me today, 
Uh, wonderful comic, fellow podcaster, Issa Medina. Yeah. Hello. What's up? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Happy to have you. Um, yeah, this has been this has been in the works for a bit because I asked you, and then well, I wanted to ask you, and then you left for Fringe. You went yeah. to Edinburgh Fringe, which how was that? How how was it your time? It was an experience. <laughs> That's how I keep describing it. It's just like it was a lot more theater kid centric than I expected it to be. I, what I'm telling comics is like. Just be fair or warned. Is that a word? Forewarned. Forewarned. <laughs> be forewarned. It's, fair warning with a forewarning. Yes. It's not a stand-up comedy festival, but it has sprinklings of stand-up comedy, which is great, but UK audiences are not as... Actually, it's it's a lot like performing stand-up comedy in Los Angeles. Like, people are not... <laughs> they don't like to laugh as much. Yeah. that's. I would say that's probably accurate. Because yeah. people... UK audiences, I think this is because UK comedy is much more, I've never heard it described as theater kid energy, but yeah. so you, but that's, that's a pretty apt description of it. It's much more, you know, there's a lot more variety in what rises to the top yeah. versus in the US where it feels like there's maybe one, there's like one distinct style that everybody seems to have who's really, yeah. really popular. It seems like in the U.S. it's like more like proper stand-up comedy. Like you go up there and you talk and you make jokes with punchlines and tags and everything. Mm -hmm. And then in the U.K. it's like act-outs and storytelling and sprinklings of funny. And obviously not everyone is like that. Like there were some very, very funny right. UK comedians, but those were like the top dogs, you yes. know, the ones who actually had like structure to their sets were like the best of the best. Yeah. They've got a structure. There's a narrative arc. Yeah. After when I did fringe, after I came back, my album was completely different because I had taken the set to fringe and ran it there a bunch. And then by with the time I came back, I was like, Oh, there's like a, I've changed this so there's an arc to the yeah to the set. There's a breaking point in the middle of the set where you're like, "I'm an artist, but I'm sad." <laughs> <laughs> yes, pretty much. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you had a good time. Yeah, it was fun. I, uh, you plan on going back? I don't know. I think if I went back, I would go back to do a version of the podcast live. Oh, fun! And then maybe run like a solo show for like a week or two. I just don't know if I could do it the whole month again. And also I would want, I just was living alone. Like it was really, it was the first time I lived alone in my life and it was just like very lonely. <laughs> and so I would want to go with like friends and a team. I mean, I had friends there, but everyone I knew was like staying in a house with people. You oh, know? okay. So yeah, yeah. I also stayed alone when I was at Fringe, but I did crave that community. Like all of the other LA comics and US comics who I went out there at, not with, yeah. but we all were like, oh, we're all here. Let's yeah. hang out. I was hanging out with them a lot. And I really tried to minimize my time alone as much as possible. Yeah, exactly. That's the move. Yeah. You got, Being you alone need, is sad. You need to have <laughs> the base, like, foundation of people that you're hanging out with. Because everybody also is going to have a mental breakdown at some point. Exactly. So you need to have people who will be like, oh, yeah, I've been there. Exactly. Like I did meet with like so many LA comics, like for brunch or for lunch. And we were all like, are you okay? No. Are you okay? No. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I had, I remember one of my favorite days of fringe when I was there, my birthday is in August. Mm -hmm. And on my birthday, I got everybody together when we went to pizza hut. The one oh, on the Royal Mile. Oh, yeah. And we were, because everybody was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, we're going to fucking Pizza Hut. Yes. I want to be a gross American. And there were like 15 of us, and it was great. It's And there's a, like a five guys across the street. Yeah. I, I'm like, that's my spot. <laughs> Please, get me in there. Yeah. Um. Well, speaking of people abroad, tra I'm, tra I'm transition really central You're today. Killing it. <laughs> uh, the movie you've brought to me today is a movie that it's pretty recent. Uh, I did not have any desire to watch it, and uh, and after watching it, I get uh, I get the sense that I made the right choice. And, yes, uh, it's not okay on Hulu. Yeah, it's called not okay, and it's also not okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not even close to okay. It's pretty bad. That's what they should have called this movie. Was pretty bad. Yeah. Um. This is a 2022. Let me pull it up. I've got now. I just got Zoe Deutsch looked up in my. Uh, I know, me too. I'm like, how thing. old is she? Whenever I see like a young, like successful actress, I'm like, how old is she? How old was she when she first popped off? Who are her parents? Mm -hmm. like, Especially who are her yeah. parents? That's something you. I, I always. That's look the for first now. thing I look for these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, she. Um, you know, she's a Disney Channel kid, and then she turned in. Uh, 
some some indie comedy kind of roles. Like her starring in this movie is not too out of place. Yeah, I would say. Um, but the premise of the movie is she plays this gal named uh, Danny Sanders, who is working for a company that is supposed to be. I mean, based on the name, the name is Depravity, and it's supposed yeah. to be like a a vice adjacent kind of thing, What's but the it doesn't other one feel that's like with a it. Bee? Um, uh, oh, uh, uh, no, Buzzfeed. Buzzfeed. I feel like it's Buzzfeed vibes. It's supposed to be. I feel like it for a name that's like hitting Vice, and they actually name check Buzzfeed in the movie. Oh, it feels yeah. m- much more like Buzzfeed. Yeah, and it feels like one of the big problems I had with this movie is that it does feel tonally like they didn't know what to do yes um i felt before we get you know even too far into the criticism we should just let you know this movie is about zoe deutsch's character who fakes a trip to paris then there's a terrorist attack in paris and then she has to fake that she survived the terrorist attack (laughs) and becomes very famous and becomes an activist and an influencer and all this crazy stuff happens it's it's supposed to be a satire. It doesn't really play like a satire. Exactly. That's like my biggest complaint is that it just like, I'm like, this could happen and this has happened probably. <laughs> yeah. I gar- I feel like this has probably happened and people have not gotten outed for it. Yeah. Uh, I would not be surprised if this happened after, I mean, there was that one terrorist attack in Paris at the Bataclan years ago. I'm sure that those people might've come out of that and been like, oh, well, you know, I survived. I was a big fan of, Eagles of Death Metal, and I'm yeah. still, I still made it. What did you, not what, why? Why did you watch this movie in the first place? <laughs> like, what drew you to this movie? Okay, I do famously love bad movies. When I'm feeling, like, stressed or, like, uh, or when I, like, go to watch TV and I don't have anything to watch, I feel like I immediately gravitate towards, like, bad movies because, and I, I saw this on TikTok, and obviously it's probably not accurate, but, like, who knows? I saw something that, like, when you have a lot of anxiety, you like to watch things that you know how they're going to end because you don't have, like, the anxiety of, like, not sure. knowing the end. Yeah, I've had, actually, there, there have been studies that show that if you spoil a movie and then you watch it, then you actually enjoy the movie more because you don't, have to sit there thinking like trying to solve yes, the movie. I always say that. I always tell people like, tell me how it ended. I don't care. Like mm-hmm. I just want to enjoy the movie. And so that's how I feel towards like rom-coms, like bad rom-coms and like Zoe Deutsch. That's her name. Deutsch. Deutsch. Yeah. She was in that bad rom-com about the assistants set it up. Have you seen it? Oh on no, I did not watch that at all. Okay, I feel like you Pete like Davidson's watch good in that movies. Too, right? Yeah. But he's in it for five seconds and I feel like they put him in the thumbnail to comedians who watch Netflix or to anyone who like likes comedy because they want you to watch the movie. Yeah, that's why they my algorithm in Netflix only shows like the funniest person in the movie yeah. because they know, well, I'm going to watch this or the person who's in the most likely like art housey kind of position. Yeah. Cuz you're right, I do I do try and not watch bad movies. I think because I get enough humble. on this podcast. Oh yeah, that's true. I get enough. I watch tons of bad movies in this on this show. Yeah, from people said being like, I just watched this bad movie. Yeah. <laughs> No, but it, uh, yeah, I don't know. I was just like tired. There was nothing else to watch on TV. And okay. Hulu was just like pushing it. You know, it was like on the homepage, on the homepage. And then I was like, you know what? Like, I'll watch it. And then normally I actually have a bad hat. I can't fall asleep during movies and I can't not finish a movie. Oh, what so, a curse. Yeah. So even if I like start a shitty movie, I like have to see it through pretty much. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I'm sort of that same way, but I also do fall asleep during movies. I to, wish I could. I I fall asleep during movies that I'm not I'm not engaged with. I think that's the common thing. But then I find myself falling asleep during movies that people say are good movies that are like part of the pantheon of good movies. Yeah. And so then I go back and I rewatch it. Like I got I pissed off my friend really bad one time because he and I he had, I had never seen The Fifth Element and I was watching it at his place. I haven't seen it. And I fell asleep. Uh, and I kept going, I make, kept making him go back to the parts that I fell asleep during and then falling asleep during them again. So I just have this. Oh my God. That's like, so annoying. Yeah, I know. I have something even worse though. What? I talk a lot during movies. Oh geez. I know. In public it's, too, or just when you're watching them at your home? Um, at home mostly, but I definitely like whisper into friends ears 
in movie theaters. Yeah, I couldn't see it. I couldn't watch a movie with you. So I know growing up, one of my best friends was like deaf in one ear and we were like a trio. There was like three of us and they would always make me sit on like the right side of my friend Carly because she just would turn her <laughs> hearing aid off. <laughs> see, I can do, if I'm watching the movie at my place or at somebody else's house, I can do the talking thing. Yeah. But when if, I, if I'm in a movie theater, that's like, I'm putting on the blinders. I don't want to talk to anybody. get mad at me. I actually, like, that's actually why I like going to the movies alone mm -hmm. because then I will talk less. Like, I'm ruining it for myself too, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I just, like, go to the movies alone. I get popcorn and then I'm, like, stuffing my mouth the whole time. So I, I won't talk to anyone. <laughs> Although I did actually... What was the um, the like Air Force movie that came out recently? Top Gun. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even the right military branch. Oh, Lisa. it's not. It's the Navy. Oh shit. The Navy for, uh, <laughs> surprise has planes. <laughs> Who knew that? Oh, I, I mean, it's you know, it's a lot of stuff they talk about in the movie. <laughs> well, they. I watched the movie. I went to go see it alone. Okay. Because I'm such a guy's girl. <laughs> And I did. There were some parts of the movie that were so insane. I like looked over at the guy next to me and I was like, this is crazy. And he was like, yeah, stop talking. <laughs> but he was kind of pumped too. Like, you know, it it's was a, a good movie. It's a real pump up kind of movie. Yeah. I love Top Gun. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I saw it sitting too close in an IMAX theater and I didn't even care that I was yeah. sitting too close because I was like, I, it's, it's an it experience. It enthralls you. It's an experience. Yeah. Unlike Not Okay. Yes. Which is a totally different kind of experience. So you start watching this movie. It's being pushed on you. Yes. At what point are you like, I wish I could turn this off, but I have to, sh I have to see this through the entire way. Oh, I just remembered. I actually watched it with a friend who was visiting from the UK. And so we were doing it after like a long, she was visiting and we'd done a bunch of activities all weekend. And so we were like, let's just have like a down night. So we like ordered Thai food and watched the movie. But immediately off the bat to answer your question, it starts off with a warning. That's like warning, unlikable female character. Oh yeah. Unlikable, like main female yeah, character. Yeah, unlikable female protagonist. Protagonist, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, how bad could it be? It gets bad. It's bad. <laughs> it's it's bad, and it's it, she's definitely unlikable. But that's not even like setting us up as an audience with a content warning like that. That's clearly a joke because yeah. it plays after the immediate regular content warning on Hulu. Yeah, and it's the same font and everything. Yeah, and it's just it feels like again this is supposed to be a satire, right? All yeah. the reviews of it say it's a satire. Everybody's talking about it in criticism world like it's a satire. And it doesn't play like one. I know. It just really doesn't. It doesn't go hard enough. Yeah. It feels like if you're going to – a satire, in my mind, should be really, really sharp and pointed and not this movie. This movie is cringy. It's so cringe, and I think it's because – now that I think about it, when you're saying like they didn't go hard enough, I think it's because maybe they were scared of going too hard that it would be like problematic, but it's like, that's the point. That's the point. It's like, it needs to be so cringy that people are like, there's no way. But like everything she does, it's like women have, women and men have done that. But oh, like, yeah. but like influencers have done that. Yes. And there's so many more real life examples, I think, of like influencers being shitty that they could have pulled from and had Zoe Deutsch's character yes, exhibit. For, for example, like when like David Dobrik had his friend like swing off like a construction like pinball thing and oh, like yeah. smashed his face open and they were like and he didn't like he didn't like pay him or anything. He paid mm -hmm. his medical bills, I think, but he like didn't do anything because right. he was like, you chose to do that. And yeah. it's like, that has a real repercussions. Like, I feel like no one got like actually physically hurt in the movie, even when it was escalating in that one. I don't know what spoiler vibes are in this. Oh, spoil. spoil. We don't get, I know we, we can spoil everything. Okay. We already talked about how much people can enjoy stuff more if they spoil. That's things, true. So. so factually you're Let's welcome. Spoil this movie <laughs> that you are probably not going to watch anyway. Yeah. So there's like a C so, well, I feel like, should we describe like what happens with like the other influencer girl, the survivor of the shooting? Yes. So there are three main characters in this movie. So there's Zoe, Zoe Deutsch's character, Danny, who as we already mentioned, lies about being in a terrorist attack in Paris. Um, there is Dylan O'Brien's character who's sort of Pete Davidson-esque. Yeah. But he is just like a stoner guy who works for this media company. 
Yeah, um, like another influencer. Yeah, that bleached hair influencer douchebag kind of guy. That Zoe is like aspiring to be like or with. Yeah, or both. Yeah. Um, and then there is... Oh, uh, man. It's it's a shame that I'm forgetting her name. Rowan Aldrin. Yes. Uh, played by Mia Isaac, who is a uh, a young lady. She's in high school. She just uh, moved to New York because she was in a school shooting. And she is now a gun rights uh, or sorry, a gun, gun control, control activist. Yeah. Um, she does not. She does not like that there are guns. She yeah. wants there to be less guns. She's she don't want. She doesn't the want them to have rights. Right. Uh, <laughs> totally reasonable. Yeah. And I think that she is actually the most sensible character in the whole movie. That's not. I don't even think there's an argument there. She's the most normal. She's yeah. the most. You know, she like the she and Zoe Deutsch meet at a violent survivors support group in New York City, and Zoe sees Rowan's career. And she like immediately gets like an idea that because mm -hmm. one of the other survivors is like, oh, my daughter's such a big fan of yours. Like, can I follow you on Instagram? And Zoe's character is like immediately like antennas up like, oh, she has followers. Like, I want to be her friend. Yeah. And so she like latches on. Yeah. And it's really creepy and really unsettling. And also accurate. <laughs> it's it's also a shame that the, the I think the most interesting character in the movie besides her is this other guy who's in the support group. Yeah. The dad who served, who was at the Ariana Grande concert yeah. bombing. I want to see his movie. I want to see him and, and Rowan figure it out. Yeah. I think that's a much more interesting story. Yeah. Than this uh, weird influencer semi satire that we're getting. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's, it was a funny little like random joke that it was this like middle-aged dad who survived the Ariana Grande concert. Yeah. But yeah, that is like an interesting story. Why was he there? Why was he there? In the United Kingdom, too. Maybe, I mean, was he there? My my guess, I'm going to write, we're writing this whole movie right yeah. now. My guess is he was there with his daughter. Oh, yeah. And maybe his daughter died in the attack. <gasps> right? Oh, my God, that makes sense. But he said, my daughter's a big fan of yours. Can I take a picture well, with you? Well, maybe there's another daughter who survived. Oh. I don't know. But she, wow, this is getting interesting. See, it's, this is much more interesting than not okay. But it's not a satire. I think this would be more of a drama. This would definitely be a drama. <laughs> but you know what? This movie should have just either played. It, it didn't pick a lane. It could have picked a lane and been a straight up drama um, with a little bit of levity here and there. Pro a like proper a dark dramedy. comedy. Yeah. yeah. And there are some really nice moments in the third act in particular whenever uh, – Rowan and Zoe are having their sort of big sister moments. Yeah. Um, which is also, I mean, it's it's clearly, it's manipulative on the part of Zoe Deutsch's character, but it's not, it doesn't feel as manipulative in the moment. Yeah. Right? It feels nice. Yeah, it feels nice. And also like, just to highlight for the listeners, if they haven't watched the movie, it's like, it's weird because it's like Zoe Deutsch's character I keep wanting to call her Zoe Deschanel. <laughs> Zoe Deschanel. Um, bootleg her, Zoe Deschanel. Yeah, like movie. her her character like seems really genuine at times, mm -hmm. but she clearly just like is really selfish. Yes. And so she gets really close to Rowan's character so that she can get clout off of her. But then she starts like kind of like stealing her words, which I think is like, um, you know, I mean, that, that happens in real life. Like white women, you know, like what is it called when you like take from appropriate? Appropriate, like, yeah. Because- Rowan's character is a black woman. Yes. And so she appropriates like a lot of the things that like Rowan says and then like gets fame for it. And so like that happens in real life. So it's like maybe something not as simple as like her words. It, like they should have like done something more that wasn't like, it's not satire. I don't know. It felt like real. Yeah. It <laughs> did. It's, it's the problem. It felt too real. It felt like it was an actual situation that could happen as opposed to the 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 point of satire i think is to make something that feels so ridiculous and goes to edit like a 10 in every possible way but it also still has the like it's a commentary on the truth it's a commentary on reality right satire yeah. is always going to have it's the knife with the point that's going to be like this is what this is what i'm getting at yeah i think that like if you look at some of the my, like my favorite satires that come to mind in recent years. Yeah, we've got Spring Breakers. I think is a great example of like oh, yeah. we're push we're we're pushing it to the limit. We're showing like oh well, if you party, you're gonna uh, you're gonna hang out with James Franco and then murder an entire gang yeah. by yourself. Yeah, we've got uh, is uh, sorry to bother you. 
Oh, wait, which one was that one again? That's the one about, uh, it's got Lakeith Stanfield. He plays a, a guy who works at a call center who figures out how to turn on his white voice and get Wait, customers. Wait, I don't think I've seen that. Oh, it's it's a very fun movie. I really enjoyed it. And it's a you know, it's 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 playing with themes of race and class and it's really interesting. Yeah. And also, you know, it starts out pretty ridiculous with like Lakeith Stanfield having white voice and David Cross doing the actual voice of the white voice. Yeah. And but then it gets to this point where it's like, what is this product that we're even selling at this call center? And oh, it turns out it's something to like turn people into horses. Oh. It's really, it gets so ridiculous so fast. Yeah. And takes all these turns, but it it, it still feels like it's grounded enough yeah. to comment on the reality of the and race and the class s- dynamics that it's hitting. Yeah, like now that you're highlighting like a example of like a good satire, I'm like, I think what was missing from this movie, Not Okay, was like her reasoning. I don't think her reasoning was big enough what she just wanted to be famous or you know like how Mm -hmm. like the first half of the movie it makes it seem like the reason she wanted to be famous was to get with dylan o'brien's character yes and then she immediately like she has sex with him and then she's over him yeah and she's like he's a shallow guy i don't want him so then she still just wants to be like more famous and i'm like that's normal Mm -hmm. everyone wants to be famous so what is her reason you know like does she and she comes from like a rich family too. So then it's like, why? Yeah. It's that's one of the things that really made me so mad about the movie in, in terms of like the potential of where it could have gone. You're already showing this, this white girl who has a rich family. She, there's, there's a very like offhand joke about it, at the very end of the movie where she's talking to her own. She's like, my mom has connections. She can get you into Soho house in Malibu. Yeah. And it's one of those lines. Where I was like, this could have been a huge laugh line. Yeah. If the movie had played with that. With her family's with that, uh, that money whole, more. Yes, the family's money should have been played with more. Yeah. They didn't play, they, they had all these little, you know, breadcrumbs about what her life was like, and they didn't highlight anything in any meaningful way to give this movie the teeth that it needed. Yeah. Yeah. It, we're getting We're getting gums with this movie. We're not getting the real like the real point. Yeah, exactly. I think like it just, there's so much like that could have been done like off like nepotism or like her dad was this one who spoiled her and Mm -hmm. her mom. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It just was like, what was her reasoning for like wanting more? We don't rarely ever find out. It was too related. It was too realistic. Yeah. Especially by the end of the movie when she is outed for having lied and for co-opting and appropriating all of this all of this trauma and all of these other people's trauma and and using it to further her own story instead of uh instead of you know copping to what she did in the first 10 minutes which yeah look i i guess she's not gonna do that we wouldn't have a movie if she didn't do yeah that. that's fine but you know what if you get to the end of the movie you see her in this support group yeah for online shamed people and she has this moment where she's like you know i uh my life is, uh, I didn't learn anything. Yeah. If if you get to the end of the movie and you're having your main character say, I didn't learn anything. Yeah. I think that's what like, so I was, I think that's what they were trying to do is that like, it was an unlikable protagonist who is so shallow that like, I think the message was like, there are just some bad shitty people in the world and they're never going to be better. And I get that. Like, that's true, but it's a movie. It's supposed to be for entertainment purposes. So then like, why are you telling us something we already know? Don't, yeah, don't make a bad, don't make a movie about a bad person who like, who's not going to have any sort of change really happen to them in a, in a way that affects them. Yeah. Right. This, the whole premise of storytelling in my mind is you have your character and by the end of their story, they are in a different place mentally yeah like they've changed they've gone through something that made them from a good person to a bad person or a bad person to a good person right or evil to nice or empathetic (laughs) and and zoe is really still in the same place yeah the only you know the only inkling we get of her having maybe changed in it it doesn't even i like how we're calling the main character zoe just based off the actress yes i don't (laughs) this is this is a a a cry for help for zoe yeah zoe deutsch needs to stop making movies like this yes she needs to change tack i feel like she would if she could but she can't so she won't no i'm just saying i'm not saying she can't book them but i'm like you know like i feel like when 
there's an actor who's like been doing the same style of movie for a while. I, I bet you they're trying out oh, yeah, for other they're just th- trying out. <laughs> they're trying out for the other things. <laughs> but she has at the very end, she goes to Rowan has this poetry reading and she goes to it and Rowan reads its poem. About, she goes to apologize. Yeah, she goes to apologize. She has this apology pre written in her in her notes app. And she goes and Rowan has this whole spoken word piece about how shitty Zoe's character was the entire movie and how she appropriated and co-opted and took her words and and lied and all this stuff. And how she like doesn't forgive her mm-hmm. pretty much for now, at least. And so then she leaves. Without apologizing. Without apologizing, which doesn't feel it doesn't feel cathartic. It also doesn't feel like she is doing that out of a desire to like lay, to leave her alone. It just feels like she's doing it. She's like, all right, well, I guess uh, I will, I will do this again whenever she is not mad at me. Yeah. Cause it also didn't feel like she wanted to apologize. Like she didn't intrinsically want to apologize to begin with. Cause mm-hmm. in the support group for survivors of internet shame yeah. <laughs> or being canceled or whatever, she, she's like, I don't even know like what to do next. And the leader of the group is like, well, have you th- even thought about apologizing? And mm-hmm. she's like, oh, I guess I could do that. Yeah. So I then guess. <laughs> she goes and then she like pussies out and. And she doesn't do it. Yeah. And it's really, it just doesn't feel, doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel like for a movie that is half in and half out of this sort of realistic way of people acting. It doesn't feel true to a character who's supposed to have changed at all yeah. for her to be exact acting the exact same, no matter what and trying to save her own skin, no matter what. Yeah. And the weird thing is that like she cries during Rowan's poem. So mm-hmm. it shows that she's like empathetic and feeling sad for what she did. But then when she leaves she, and doesn't apologize to Rowan, she kind of leaves with like a shrug. Yeah. It's kind of like, a, eh, what's the point? So it's like, are you sad or are you like, not, do you not feel anything for yeah. this girl? What, how, what which which is it? Yeah, because you gotta. If here's the, the 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 toughest thing that she could have done in, the, in that moment as a character is actually a, is gone to try and apologize and then gotten like yelled at. Yes, that would have been great. That would have been great, and it would have been a much more interesting place to end the movie, and especially because then it would there would have at least been a story arc for Rowan because Rowan would have been able to like stand up for herself, mm-hmm. and like it would have like someone would have gotten some kind of redemption. Yes. But there's no redemption. There's no redemption. And that's what they say. Part nine, no redemption. What is with the parts in this movie, by the way? Oh, my God. This is the first note I wrote is the movie is, why is it in chapters? I. What is this? That was one of the biggest things that bothered me about the movie. Because when we got to chapter like three, like 25 minutes into the movie, I was like, oh, is it almost over? But no, it goes to nine. It goes to nine chapters. And why? It's so weird. Why don't like, obviously it's not, it's not a concise or traditional story telling mechanism because they had to break it up into nine pieces. When is a story ever broken up into nine pieces? It doesn't make sense. No, this is, there's no need for it. It's got all the, the movie, this movie makes a lot of really strange stylistic choices and I don't think any of them really work. Yeah, I think it's because they kind of fucked up the story arc so bad that they needed to tell the audience how to feel, you know? Mm -hmm. Because they were like, part one, this is what's happening. Part two, this is what's happening. And it's like, maybe just make a movie that (laughs) we know what's happening. Yeah, maybe you you show us how they're feeling instead of telling us how we're supposed to feel. You know, the way you make a movie. Yeah. Show, don't tell. (laughs) Yeah. Have you ever seen... I learned that like one year after moving into LA and I was like, I really want to like show, not tell it. (laughs) And I was like, I changed the game. I did this myself. I have figured out how to do movies. <laughs> yeah. I I am the storyteller now. Yeah. I show. I don't tell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just wish there's so much that could have happened in this movie that would have been more interesting. Especially, I mean, there's such a rich, you know, well to pull from with all of these characters. Yeah. Even beyond the characters who we have are our main three characters. There's all these stock supporting characters. Nobody feels like they're really dialed in to be 
anything other than just a stereotype. Like yes. it doesn't feel like, again, with the satire, it could have gone further, but instead they were just like, all right, we're going to have uh, a, a lesbian with a short haircut and glasses. <laughs> I know that was so, so annoying. <laughs> We're going to have a we're going to have a black gay man who just wears tank tops. Yeah, it was really just like so it makes me feel like the movie was almost do you think maybe it was like meant to be a show? Do you think it was like written as a pilot and then they were like, "Oh, like we'll develop these characters out throughout the series, but then they ended up switching it into a feature?" You know, I mean that I could see that potentially happening. Yeah. I feel like if it was that, that would make sense as to why it was in chapters. If it started out and they're like, we're going to make this a, a mini series or a, sh or, a, or a full series. And then in the notes process or in the sales process, they're like, actually, we're just going to do this as a movie because that's what we're going to budget it for. Yeah. Instead of completely rewriting it to make it a much more pointed, contained piece. Yeah. We are left with this sort of half-assed in multiple directions project that doesn't feel like it really takes a stand in yeah. any possible way. Yeah. And also is it's just like it's all it's it's all style, very little substance, but even the style's weird. I know. I think it just falls on and then I'm going to say this and I'm going to say one thing about being a critic. Please. But um I think it just falls under this like high high low budget, like lower budget of the higher budget like Netflix, Hulu, like they just like, it's almost like a Disney Channel movie. They're just cranking these out for children pretty much, you know? Yes. And then when I'm watching it, I'm like, mm, am I supposed to be watching this? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's interesting to like think about what the critics are saying about this movie too, because it's got a 73%, 3%, 73% on what? Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. The I would have been sure it had a 49 at least. Yeah. The consensus of this says... Even if it may not add much to the discourse, Not Okay makes some salient points about online life with extra sparkle added by an effervescent Zoe Deutsch. Okay, that's the thing is like, it's annoying that they're getting points for making a point, a couple points that we talk about on Twitter every day. Like, like yes. all the points that they're making aren't like groundbreaking. No. It's like, we literally know like Karens exist and they're problematic. Yeah. You know? You have... So much opportunity to to say something beyond what is already in the public internet discourse literally every day. And you're not going to take the opportunity to do that? Yeah. And I and in the fact that they were in the internet space, too, I feel like there could have been a lot punchier of jokes. You know, like there's yes. so many punchy – like there are so many opportunities to punch it up to be funnier, mm -hmm. like laugh out loud moments. Yes. And they just didn't do that. But really quickly, I just wanted to say, I don't think I'm like inherently like a critic because like whenever I criticize, and we do this on my podcast too, like we, you know, we analyze like zeitgeisty groups that are cults or not. And yes. so we did like, we recorded Taylor Swift on Monday, like the cult of Taylor Swift. And I'm kind of a Taylor Swift stan, but obviously we have to like critique to like talk about right. things. And like, even just talking about this movie, I'm like, yeah, like it was bad. And there were so many things that were wrong with it. And then I'm like, oh no. But like, what about like a person who like was working on a movie for the first time? And there was like a big deal that they were like working on a Hulu movie. Yeah. You know, I'm like, people work so hard to get these projects greenlit. And I'm like, damn. I mean, that's the thing too. It's like, I, I work in the industry. Yeah. You work in the industry. We understand, like, I know how much it sucks to have people not like your stuff. Yeah. But the, the thing is, you open yourself up to it. Yeah, that's true. Anytime you create something, you're opening yourself up to the discourse. Yeah. And I think that I I am not uh, somebody who's never going to watch a movie made by Quinn Shepard again. Yeah. You know, she made a movie that won Sundance. I think one of the most like... Wait, was she the director of this movie? Uh, Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She made... Uh, what was it called? The Miseducation of Cameron Post. Oh. Writer and director of this movie. Wow. Yeah. I mean, she also probably like, you know, directors have movies that they're like, okay, this is going to be like my award winning movie and this is going to be like my quick cash movie. You mm -hmm. know, like some people just like are trying to make a book. Yeah. But it could have been. <sighs> she probably also ran up. A, a, I'm like making excuses. She also probably ran up against a lot with like, I mean, I don't know when you're developing a movie from scratch with like a network 
executives are like are so in the weeds on it too and mm-hmm. like they're like oh no but and they're so basic that like they think people just like won't understand more complex things like things so yeah. that i feel like they probably like dumbed it down a lot probably it's sh- it's a shame that this movie probably got dumbed down in the notes process yeah because there are i think great examples of like sharp social media satires that exist you know the uh, anger goes west yeah is a great example I think it's sort of the flip side of like not somebody who's an influencer, but somebody who's like trying to, who who is a, a, a stan of an influencer and stalks her and has this crazy parasocial relationship that becomes yeah. very dangerous feeling. And she becomes at the very end, like she tries to kill herself and then she becomes an influencer in her own right because she survived the suicide attempt and yeah. everybody is like becomes, you know, rushes to her support online and the last shot, it's Aubrey Plaza playing the lead, Ingrid. And Wait, she, what's the movie called again? Ingrid Goes West. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's one of it's one of my favorites. I haven't seen it, but I need to write these movies it's down. It's really good. And she's sitting there in her hospital bed, and all of these like positive notifications are popping up all around her. And then just she just has this crazy like it's the first time she smiles in the entire movie, and then it cuts to credits. Oh my god. After this whole movie of her being depressed and like then trying to befriend this this influencer, it's a really but it cuz it ends cuz it leaves you like wanting more. I feel like maybe the problem with the movie is that they saw it through a little too far. Yeah. Cuz like it went full arc to the point where you're like, "Okay, I guess people don't change." <laughs> but we sh- we could have had a moment of at least you know, it's a movie. Yeah. Show us that your character is going to change. Yeah. Why are you making this movie if your character's not going to change at all? Yeah. Well, I was just looking and Quinn Shepard yes. is a white woman. So I don't know. Maybe she like. Maybe she's trying to tell us something about how white about women herself. actually never change. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, is there something else that you feel like people who hated Not Okay should watch instead that would they would like? Um, heard of Top Gun? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an obvious one. Everybody should watch Top Gun if they haven't. Yeah. Um oh, I don't know. I mean, there's so many movies I want to see right now that I haven't seen yet. Um but I don't know. I'm like so bad with rem- remembering names of movies that mm. I've watched. Let me think. Let me think. Let me think. Um School of Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a good choice. I mean, I just was asked recently about like a moment, like what is one of my favorite like redemption moments like in a movie? And uh-huh. I th- immediately thought of School of Rock. So it's like top of mind when like the kids pick him up from his house it is a nice after he'd been moment. fired and then they wake him up from being like hung over and they come outside and all the kids are dressed like in punk clothes yeah, waiting in the van looking like vans. drug addicts. <laughs> it's a great movie. That's a movie that people should go watch instead of this. Yes. Yeah, exactly, because it actually serves the same purpose. It's like, you're going to watch Not Okay because you're like, oh, I'm I'm feeling like watching something easy, fun, digestible. And then you're like, oh, this is not, this wasn't fun. <laughs> no, this is not only not fun, but it's complex, but it's overly, it, it's trying to pretend that it's more complex than it actually yes, is. Yes, but instead it's just like story arc whiplash. Right. There's a difference <laughs> between complex and convoluted. And yeah. I think this is more convoluted. Yes. It's a shame. Is there any movies that you think people should watch? I don't What should I watch? You I mean, mentioned a couple. Yeah, you should definitely watch Ingrid Goes West. Yeah. If you want to do like the social media satire overlap. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think, like I said, Spring Breakers is one of my all-time favorite Oh, I satires. did watch that one. Yeah. And I, uh, I highly recommend Sorry to Bother You. Right. I need to watch that. Pointed, strange, funny, crazy, very good. Cool. Um. But Issa, thanks for doing the show. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having of me. Of course. Where can the listeners talk to you, see what you got going on, and uh, and also agree with you about not watching Not Okay? Okay. Uh, or not liking uh, it, rather. Right. Um, I'm on Instagram at Issa Medina, I-S-A-A-M-E-D-I-N-A-A. Same thing on TikTok and Twitter with an underscore at the end, LOL. But um, my And I have a podcast called Sounds, Sounds Like, like a Cult. Sounds Like a Cult. Yes. Yes. Um, which is available wherever you get podcasts, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. I hope. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. I hope. Um, cool. You can find me at Diet J on Twitter and Instagram, jlightcomedy.com for show dates, at Blockbusting Pod for the social media for just the show. And uh, and if you like the show, subscribe on Patreon. You get bonus episodes, you get 
uh, access to my full film server library at $5 a month. There's a lot of crazy stuff on there. Which is important. Yes. If you want to watch a good movie when you're feeling down. Yeah, I've got some good stuff on there. I've got some real... I, I should subscribe because then I'll know what to watch instead of what not to watch. It's very handpicked. I don't know if I have Ingrid Goes West on there. Maybe I'll put Ingrid Goes West on there after mm. this. It's a, it's worth it. It's yeah. worth putting on there. Um, thanks again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Of course. This has been Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. Okay.